Hi, everybody. Uh, this is um, Kevin and Amanda, and that's Beverly on the other screen. Um, we're here to talk about Beverly Conley's work. Um, Beverly received the Jurors Award and the She Exhibition back oh, a few months ago, and Sandra Chin, uh, Chin Weinstein was the juror for that. And as a result of that, Beverly had a, um, a solo exhibition here in the gallery. And we're going to do, in, in, in lieu of a blog, we're going to do this recording, this Zoom recording. So we've, we've never done this before, so bear with us. So Kevin is going <laughs> to read the bio. Hi, Beverly, by the yeah, way. Yeah, hi, Beverly. <laughs> hi. <laughs> okay. Beverly Connolly is a documentary photographer in Benicia, California. She finds true satisfaction in long-term self-assigned projects that focus on individuals and contemporary society. Her quest has allowed her to enter the private worlds of people living in and around the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas, gypsies and travelers in England, the Cherokee Nation in Northeastern Oklahoma, steel workers in Weirton, West Virginia, and the Cape Verdean communities in Boston and in, Cape, and in the Cape Verde Islands. Solo exhibitions include the George Meany Center for Labor, the Boston Public Library, the Fort Smith Regional Art Museum in Arkansas, the Museum of Native American History and Culture in Bentonville, Arkansas, and A. Smith Gallery in Johnson City, Texas. Her work has been featured in juried exhibitions and group so shows such as the Festival of American Folk Life at the Smithsonian Institution, Off the Beaten Path at the Collector's Photography Gallery in Corte Madera, California, and slow exposure celebrating photography of the rural South at the Cochrane Gallery in LaGrange, Georgia. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her work has been published in a number. Oh, wait a minute, I'm gonna skip that one. <laughs> Beverly is the recipient of a Michigan Creative Artist Grant, and she has received awards from the Utah Press Association and the Fort Smith Art Center. She has also received an excellence award from Black and White Magazine for her contribution to their 2017 special issue and received the Jurors Award at A. Smith Gallery in Johnson City, Texas for the She Exhibition in 2022. She is a member of the American Society of Media Photographers. Well, welcome, Beverly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so how did you get into photography? I first became interested in photography when my sister and her boyfriend set up a dark room in my parents' laundry room. I was thrilled by their photographs and just became so enchanted with the darkroom process. Uh, to me, it really looked like magic. After that, I started going to a lot of photography exhibitions at galleries and museums in San Francisco. And eventually I, I enrolled in San Francisco City College's photography program. It was a great program and they taught everything from documentary to photojournalism, to studio, to portrait architecture and darkroom. The best thing about it was that you could also check out the cameras. And uh, they also had a lot of speakers that came to the different classes. And one of my favorite speakers was Marion Post Walcott. Who... Oh, no. <laughs> the mission full time. And uh, she was just absolutely fantastic. And I found out that before she was hired by the Farm Security Administration, she was a photojournalist for magazines and newspapers and paved the way for women in photojournalism. She also was responsible for doing away with gender restrictions in the darkroom. She, um, at the Farm Security Administration, she, paved the way for women to leave their homes and to get themselves involved in photojournalism and travel. Uh, I'll never forget her words. She said, find your own vision and speak with your images from your heart and your soul. Um, anyway, after that, I became, um, one of my first jobs was to work at a small newspaper in Utah. And when I was there, I covered everything. Uh, and not only was I able to photograph in the community, but I could photograph all over Utah, including the Sundance Film Festival, which was fabulous. I, uh, one of my first documentary projects was to photograph a shepherd who worked on one of the largest sheep ranches in Utah. 
And uh, I was able to follow him and I was able to also document the sheep shearers who came from New Zealand. Um, and not to mention the border collies who did the herding. I really, really enjoyed the job at the Utah, at the newspaper and learned so much and have to say that, so my, my interest in photography really came from my sister and her boyfriend working in the darkroom and going to City College and then by uh, working at the newspaper. Well, fantastic. You know, looking at your, your through your imagery, um, it, it, it appears that, you, that you're attracted to projects that focus on the culture of a people. Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yes, I've always been interested in different cultures and have found that documentary photography is all about learning and about curiosity. Uh, I just also love the fact that when you're doing photo documentary projects, you're not an art director. You're not telling people where to stand or you're not telling them how to dress. You, it's all about the flow of life. And I, I really, really love that. And uh, it's also more about conversation actually than using the camera all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Because there has to be a certain amount of connection, right? Or, uh, exactly. Yeah, and and yeah. I think you doing photo documentary you do a lot of studying and learning about the people or the places that you're going to photograph and document. It, and, and am I right that most of the work is black and white? Is that right? Or... It is. I, I, I did do a lot of commercial work before and during. Right. But, uh, my major projects are in black and white. And, and why do you choose black and white over, over color? I think I just love the feel of it. It's It's... Mm -hmm. It's just got so much drama to it and and emotion. Right, right. I agree. I agree. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to screen share some of your images. I think we have 10 different projects here and a couple of images from each one. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, let's start on this one. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Okay, I, I started photographing the Cape Verdean community in about 1986 till about 1991. And uh, I, I moved to Boston and became fascinated by the Cape Verdeans. Uh, there were in my area of Dorchester and Roxbury about 10,000 Cape Verdeans living there. And uh, so I became very interested in them and with, and I was able to, to document them by talking to uh, the church, which was their St. Patrick's Church, which was their center. And I talked to a Capuchin monk, Father Pio, who was sent there from Cape Verde Islands to look after the community. I contacted him and he paved the way for me to document the people. So the first thing I did was he said, come to church and stand out there after mass and I'll tell the people what you're doing. So I stood out there and they came out and they were wonderful. And I immediately started photographing people. And from that time on, I was able to do weddings and baptisms and photograph people in their homes. And Fantastic. that's when I did that. So so where where exactly are the Cape Verde Islands? It's it's off the coast of West Africa, off of Senegal. And there's a series of 10 islands, and nine of them are inhabited. And the people first started coming from the Cape Verde Islands to New England when the whaling ships would stop off there in the 18th century. Uh -huh. And uh, they became, they were stopping there for supplies and to hire workers. And, uh, and eventually when the whaling went out, when it stopped, the people became the, the main workers in the New England cranberry industry. And, Interesting. Uh, so, and, uh, uh, do they speak Portuguese? They what they do is 
they speak a language called Criollo. Okay. And but there were so many influences in Cape Verde Island. There were the Portuguese, of course, the French, even the Italian were in there for a bit, and the English. So the on the different islands, they speak a different Criollo because it's interspersed with different words from the people who were in there. Right. Like it could have some French words. And uh, on one of the islands, Brava, the children are taking French classes. So it's kind it's of like a real... I, I guess they're a mix of nationalities then too, right? They really are. They're, yeah. In fact, the women are more African than the men. I don't know how that happened, but right. uh, the, the, the men have more of a European descent in them. Interesting. Now, the, now we're in Cape Verde Islands. Because there were so many people of Cape Verdean descent, I mean, 10,000 where I was living, there was a consulate. And I, I decided that I really wanted to photograph on the islands. So I talked to the consulate and they gave me a grant to go to the islands. And it turned out that they had a Cape Verdean airline. So I, I talked to my friends that were Cape Verdean and told them that I was going to their homeland. And many of them decided to go too. So the airline was actually almost packed with everybody I knew. And uh, I was so fortunate because then I was able to stay with their friends and relatives on almost all the islands. And this one was taken on Brava. Wonderful shot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This one uh, was taking, taken in Fogo, uh, another one of the islands. Uh, basket weaving is a very big thing in Cape Verde. And, and they sell their baskets. And they're beautiful. Is it, a, is it a real tropical island or is it an arid type of You know, island? each island is really different. Some of them are volcanic, um, like this one is. Uh, some of them are, are, are really dry. Uh, some are mountainous. Um, they really vary. And one of the big overall problems though, is that they, uh, they don't have enough rain. So mm -hmm. that's why a lot of people leave. Mm -hmm. It's very dry. So I guess they exist on rainwater there. Do they have wells or? Yeah, they do. Um, they, a lot of times, depending on where you are, um, some of them just get their water from a stream <laughs> or something. Right, you know? right, right. Wow. And, and there are, some of the islands are very rugged. There aren't any bathrooms. <laughs> When you yeah. see there, you go up on the mountain with the sheep and everything. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and that's no fun, especially at night. <laughs> Very dark. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> rustic, yeah. Yeah, I would stay with I would stay with one of my really good friends from um, from Boston and and uh, in 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 at her family's house, and that was one of the areas. It was pretty rustic and. We'd plan it so we'd go up on the mountain together. <laughs> a little creepy. <laughs> oh, God. So you really got to experience the true flavor of the place. <laughs> oh, I did. Yeah. There's not a holiday yet. Yeah, no. <laughs> the wonderful thing, though, about the Cape Verde Islands is that their food is just fabulous. I love their cooking. Oh. <laughs> so that's good. What What's it similar to? Um, well, corn is a big thing. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of dishes with, with corn. And uh, they also, because they're on the water, there's a lot of uh, a lot of fish, which is a lot of seafood, which is really good. Right, too. right. Um, okay, so the next group. This is the Smithville Market. Yeah, now that's in um, England. When I, li I lived in London. And I did this project from 1991 to 1992. And uh, this happened to be a big meat company, G. Stratus and Company. And the markets were 
huge in central London when I lived there. And uh, in fact, they it now is gone. Now there it's in a whole nother spot of London. It's not in central London anymore. But uh, so I guess they're, sure. they're moving meat around on those carts. Is that what that? Oh yeah, and yeah. Uh, the next picture you'll see that yeah. he's called he's called a, a bummery, and uh -huh. they transport the meat, the sold meat. Mm. Wow. And one thing that was happening then, which I didn't put that picture in, but there, there's uh, a, a, a porter and they were they would carry the meat on their shoulders. But then soon after I left my project, the they decided it wasn't very healthy to have the meat on shoulders. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so that ended. <laughs> right. And uh, but now well. this man, his name was Alf Dixon. And well, he, was it? he lived there for, I mean, he worked there for years and years. He was in his 80s. Wow. And he's still pulling that cart. Wow. He was still pulling the cart. And when it was loaded with meat, it got pretty heavy. I'm oh, sure. Wow. wow. Interesting. Uh, now you're in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I was in New York, I did a lot of street photography. And this one was at a uh, called the Feast of San Gennaro Festival. And I, I like this picture because I just happened to get them both puffing at the same time. I was I was just yeah. about to say that. Boy, you caught just, that I mean, at the exact right moment. They weren't even looking at each other. It Correct. just happened. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, so these are this looks like money that's attached up here. Yeah. Yeah. Because people would say a prayer and then their prayer would come true. Ah, okay. <laughs> supposedly. <laughs> right. Interesting. And I, I did a lot of photography in Chinatown in New York. I, I loved roaming around at night and capturing the people and, and especially him. He was wonderful. So, what is he playing there? It's like a, a checkers type thing. Wow. And he would be out there every night. Is he, are people giving him money? Is that what this is right here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He gets money. And I think they get to play. Uh huh. Probably, huh. I think a lot of the Asian folk would, would do it. Right. Would know how to do it <laughs> anyway. So, what year is all this taking place? Um, that was 1991 to 94 that I lived in. In New York, yeah, and uh, just really was. I, I had a job too, but I but I also did a lot of the street photography. <laughs> now you're in Cleveland, mm -hmm. Ohio, and I lived in Cleveland from '94 to '97, and this area was called. Um, East was in East Cleveland, and um, it was a little area of mainly African American shops, and and it had a lot of beauty salons and hair hair places, and um, for men and women barber shops and barber schools, but that is all gone, totally gone now. Mm -hmm. It's all high rises and fancy restaurants. Yeah, that's happening well, everywhere. Great. Yeah, I was so fortunate to capture that. Right. And the people were lovely. They were, they were just so lovely. And good hair it is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was at a, uh, called, his name was Jerome Ambers, and he was steaming a hat at Mike the Hatter. It was a, a hat shop. Oh, that's a great shot. But it's just so sad that it's, I was so sad when it's all gone. So that's part of that same area that you were just talking it's the same about. Same thing. Yeah, it yeah. was just all little shops. Wow. It was mainly African-American owned, but there were a few Asian folks in there, too, that had shops. Right. 
like there was a wonderful Asian woman that I got to know who had a, a wig shop. <laughs> she sold a lot of wigs. Wonderful. And now you're in Oklahoma, in Cherokee country. One uh, place that I did photograph was at a Native American prep school out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And when I was there, I met a couple who were teachers from um, Oklahoma. And they invited me to come out to their area and document their friends and relatives. And I did that from 2000. What, 1998 to 2004. And this this uh, family was called the Muskrat family. And this boy is having his regalia adjusted by his grandmother. I think that's that's what makes the shot so wonderful. Uh, that's great. It's kind of interesting because she's not in native clothing, but no, the grandfather no. and the boy are. <laughs> Yeah, that's what that's not, yeah, that, that really makes the photograph work because you got the juxtaposition of the Native American gear with her just in yeah. street clothes. They were uh, getting ready to dance, the two of them. So, what's your process? Do you shoot and then go talk to them, or you go talk to them and ask them if you can shoot and, and get their name? Oh, yeah, I, I, I always ask, yeah, if I, if I can do it. I and um, uh, like. I, I did have my contacts with a couple that worked at a Native American prep school. A lot of times I'll have a contact that will pave the way for me. Right. And, uh, but but I, I usually don't just go in and do it unless it's um, like that New York scene where they're just up there, uh, a festival or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Then, I'll, then I will just go sh take pictures. Right. But like I, I photographed that the muskrat family and then they invited me to have dinner with them that night <laughs> so, it was perfect <laughs> it was so sweet and these girls are in their tear dresses and they were getting ready to dance too so are they cherokee also yes It's, it was a real mix of people. Some are very traditional and some are not. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it, I mean, it's hard to tell what time frame this picture would, mm -hmm. you know, you, it's got a, that could have been taken in the 1800s or yesterday, right? That's the thing about their traditional uh, ways, you know, you really can't tell. Right. And now you're in Cleveland at LTV Seal. And I titled him the Matador because he looks like a Matador with that holding that cape up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that was in the blast furnace area. So how, how did you get yourself in there? I, I talked to um, a man who was like one of the, the director of um, LTV Seal. And he thought it'd be a wonderful idea. They didn't really have, hadn't had anybody documenting it. And the fortunate thing is, or the sad thing is that that's all gone too, uh, wow. from that area. Yeah. Now there's another area <clears throat> and it's owned by um, another company. It's called Cleveland Cliffs that owns a lot of different steel mills, in, including in the United States and in Canada. And that was, there were female workers and I, I, I documented a lot of them too. That's gotta be some incredibly difficult, hot work, boy. Oh, it's hot. And I, I had to wear all the garb too. Right. I had the hat, the boots, the, the coat like she had on and right. everything he told me it was uh, necessary to photograph in there. I hope it wasn't in the summertime. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> Although I did do it year round, I did photograph them for quite a while. But when I first started, well, now there are um, there's about twenty seven thousand workers between U.S. and Canada. And now you're, I, I got very interested in workers <laughs> and. 
this is in Weirton, West Virginia. And uh, these are titled number nine tandem mill workers. And this, this company was also purchased by the same company that now owns the Cleveland company. Right. But it's it's really gone down. Um, it, the, when I was there, they had a blast furnace. They had every, it was a totally integrated mill, and now all they have is a tin mill. Yeah, that industry has been hit really hard. Oh, it really has. Really sad because the whole town has gone down the hill. You know, mm -hmm. it affected everything from the hospitals to the schools to everything. Right. This guy kind of looks like Elvis Costello. I don't know if you know. <laughs> he, <does. laughs> he has that same look, doesn't he? <laughs> oh Maybe my God. He was working there getting some some uh, information for a song, I guess. I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And this man is called uh, a strip mill worker. I love this shot. This this really stuck out to me when I went through them earlier. I like the texture in that one. Yeah. It's just I haven't been back really since it's all different and gone. Right. And uh, I became when I lived in Michigan, I became very interested in uh, the migrant workers, and uh, these are blueberry workers and I did that from 1997 to 2002 uh, but I, I also photographed migrant workers on a potato farm and these are all migrant workers from Mexico Mexico and, and Central America I would imagine yeah you're right And they're very Catholic, and uh, this is one right. of their masks. That little boy was going to be blessed. <laughs> uh, looks like he has a broken arm or yeah. something. Yeah, he does. He had a lot of little problems going on. Wow. So where were they? They were holding masks like in a parking lot or a building, or yeah, it's like a, a, a abandoned like building. And they, they'd have regular mass and, and then they'd have different ceremonies where they'd go through the vineyard, I mean, the uh, blueberry farm and and, uh, and bless the crops. But I also have a lot of pip uh, pictures of where their house, where they live. Right. And now you're on my latest project, which I'm still planning to continue with. And this is in the back hills of the Ozark Mountains in uh, Arkansas. And this is the image of one of the Jurors Award yes. here. Yes. Yeah. yes. And I, I always like this image because I was so, th she called me. I had photographed her quite a bit and her family. And she called me and said, a man down the way was leaving town and gave her a bunch of chickens. And she said that she didn't know what to do with them, but he kind of gave her a few little lessons and she thought I might want to come and see what she was doing. And uh, I love the fact that she had a dress on. And, <laughs> you know, and then all the smoke it was perfect. That's a great shot. But if you look, uh, especially when I do an 11 by 14 print, you can see little chicken faces all over the place. Really? Well. Wow. They're pretty much trying to get out of the way, I think. <laughs> you know, yeah. They're running. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they know. Yeah, run for yeah. your life. <laughs> oh, there's two right here. There's one there. Another, mm -hmm. another guy over here. Yeah, you can see yeah. them if you really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They weren't sticking around though at all. Like, what the hell is going on? We <laughs> better get, get out, me out of here. here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think that's the last image. Oh, we have one. more. Okay. Oh, here's another one. Yeah. Oh, this was um, in Arkansas and in other places in the South. 
do what they call uh, noodling. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they catch the fish by their hand. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I never understood it because they have teeth. You know, these big things have teeth. <laughs> and, uh, but they caught that one by the hand. And, and this was a regional noodling competition in Oklahoma. So how did you happen to be there? Well, I knew it was going to happen, and I lived in Arkansas. And so I went to Oklahoma and got a motel room and stayed there for the competition. And there were also a lot of uh, people from Arkansas in the competition, too. Right. That's great. <laughs> but I love their faces and the expressions. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it was perfect. And they, they got the prize, so they, they had the biggest one. That's a big catfish. I tell you what, I don't know. I could even hold it. I mean, some of them are like two hundred pounds. You know, wow. they're solid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think that is the last one. That is that is the last. Okay, well, let's stop the share here. No, nope. no. I think we need to kind of wrap it up. Don't you think? For the share, I said. Oh, the share. share. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not the whole thing, but the share. <laughs> what? <laughs> there we okay. go. Well, Beverly, it's been great talking to you. Wonderful talking to you, and I appreciate so much you're doing this. Thank you. Well, you're sure. very welcome, and, and thanks so much for supporting the gallery. We we really uh, appreciate that. I'll tell you when I I come out and see my son um, uh, in Austin. We're going to do a drive out to your gallery, and I'll let you know. Okay. And I was so sorry to miss the reception. Yeah. We'd love to have you. Yep. Come on out. But we'll come. Thank All you right. so much. Okay. Thank you. Take care and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs>